Well, I'm always um, very pleased and privileged to moderate these panels because this is where we have the researchers, both clinical and um, lab researchers that are really doing the heavy lifting on the front lines. And we have a really great group with us today. They include Dan Chung um, with Spark Therapeutics. Um, he, he's been very involved in the Luxterna trials, but I will caution, I know because of regulatory issues, now that you have an FDA approved therapy, you can't um, talk about the Luxterna trials in a lot of detail. But I know Dan was involved in developing the mobility course that um, helped, that, that was used as an outcome measure to help um, show that Luxterna was actually working. And then we have Dr. Uh, Susanna Sunchan Park from University of California, Davis. And I've uh, been in touch with her over the years, hearing about her bone marrow stem cell clinical trial. So I'm excited to hear updates about that. And then um, last, but by no means least, is David Rodman, who is with uh, ProQ, um, ProQR Therapeutics. And all those great trials that I talked about for LCA, Ush2A, Rhodopsin, um, that's what they're involved in. And um, I'm sure he'll be more, um, be happy to elaborate on those more. But to get things going, I, I'm going to go through a couple of questions with the panel, and then we'll open it up to questions from those of you that have joined the webinar. But uh, to start off, Dan, Dr. Chung, can you talk a little bit about your role at Spark? Sure. Well, it's definitely a pleasure to be with you all today. And thanks to uh, Ben, Donna, and Chris for some fast adjustments from a live meeting to this virtual meeting. So uh, for myself, uh, in this uh, time, I've been uh, homebound now for about uh, three weeks. Uh, so it's good to join you all virtually. Uh, I trained as a pediatric ophthalmologist with extra training in inherited retinal disease and retinal gene uh, therapy. I serve as a SPARKS ophthalmologist and uh, IRD resource uh, based in medical affairs, uh, heavily involved in clinical development and pretty much any other facet of the company that needs uh, ophthalmology uh, expertise. So one of those things I get to be involved in is patient advocacy, which I very much enjoy. So I do a little bit about everything. And uh, as Ben mentioned, I've been at pretty much every level of development for Veritagene, which is the RP65 gene therapy uh, at University of Pennsylvania Children's Hospital before I came to Spark. And then obviously the uh, post-marketing and approvals uh, that received, uh, we received once uh, we had, had Spark develop. Great, and Veretta Gene is Luxterna. Can you, are you able yeah. to say Luxterna, Dan? Uh, you know, I think that uh, I, I might be able to. I don't to, need but to put I, you on the hot seat there. Yeah. I, I think uh, because of the virtual world, I, I don't know exactly who's out there, so. But uh, Veretta Gene is, is uh, the um, a generic name, so. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. And Dr. Park, can you tell us about what you do at UC Davis and maybe just give a quick intro to your bone marrow stem cell trials? Um, thank you. And thank you to the organizers of the symposium uh, for including me and the panelists. Um, I am a ophthalmologist who takes care of patients with retinal problems. So I'm a fellowship trained vitreo retinal specialist. I am also a full-time faculty member in the Department of Ophthalmology at UC Davis. And as such, I do teaching as well as research. And because I'm a, a clinician seeing patients, um, I do clinical research, but I do have a PhD and I do conduct bench or laboratory research. And my area of interest is uh, exploring and developing new treatments for uh, blinding retinal conditions that my patients have. And of interest, I'd like to uh, take observations that we make in laboratory research and bring it to clinical trial to see if these treatments work for our patients with untreatable uh, vision loss from retinal conditions. So the area of research I wanted to share with you is uh, the use of stem cells 
in our own bone marrow as potential treatment for blinding retinal conditions. Now, uh, Ben did a nice overview of uh, various stem cells that are being used for tissue replacement. So basically, you, you're making pluripotent stem cells and then uh, genetically modifying them to become retinal cells so you can replace uh, the damaged retina in patients with retinal problems. We're taking a slightly different approach. Uh, we are exploring the repair potential of stem cells that we have in our own bone marrow. And it's been known now for over 20 years that there are stem cells in our bone marrow characterized by a protein on the surface called CD34. And these stem cells are repair stem cells in our own body. So if we have a damaged tissue, including damaged retina, the damaged tissue releases a signal into your bloodstream. And uh, the signal mobilizes these repair stem cells into your circulation. And the stem cells find the damaged tissue, if it's retina, and incorporate into the damaged tissue and secrete factors, growth factors, proteins that stimulate repair. So we wanted to see if we can maximize the repair potential of these repair stem cells we have in our bone marrow. And we have, an, and others have shown that you can harvest these stem cells and it, inject them directly into the eye, similar to the way you get injections for wet macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. And we've shown in animal studies that these cells incorporate into the damaged tissue and cause molecular changes in the retina that seem to stimulate repair. And we have shown in animal models of diabetic retinopathy that you can preserve the retinal vascular damage associated with that. We've also seen in an animal model of retinal degeneration that you can preserve the retinal function and retinal uh, cells that are damaged from that condition. So, What's nice about this cell therapy is that it's not unique to a specific disease or to a specific cell. The effect of the stem cells on the damaged tissue appears to be a response to whatever the damage is, and it tries to uh, reprogram the cells to repair themselves to whatever is causing the injury. So in a sense, it's, it has multiple possible uh, repair uh, roles and may potentially have broad clinical applications. So what we've shown in, in animal studies is that you can inject human CD34 cells from bone marrow into animal eyes with immunosuppression so you don't have a tissue re cell rejection. And there's no bad thing that happens in the eye or in other parts of the body of the animals. So there seems to be long-term tolerance of the cell therapy. And um, based on the animal studies, we did get uh, clearance from the Food and Drug Administration to explore the cell therapy in our patients with blinding retinal conditions. And we felt that this cell therapy can be applied for different types of diseases, whether they be retinal degenerative conditions like retinitis pigmentosa, whether it be circulatory problems like diabetic retinopathy or retinal vein occlusion. So we took all comers. And for the pilot study, uh, basically it's a safety study to see if we can do this and whether there are any bad things happening in the eye with this treatment. And um, we noted that this treatment is feasible. We can harvest a large amount of cells for injection. And uh, so far we haven't had any negative effect of injecting the cells in the eye. And um, you know, more than half the patients seem to have some visual gain that we can um, note both subjectively and objectively. And um, so based on these observations, we are in the process of, ex of exploring the cell therapy for specific clinical indications. So in our uh, early phase study, the patient who seemed to have the most dramatic improvement in vision was actually a patient with central retinal vein occlusion. We could see changes in the retina as well as visual acuity changes. And so currently we were very fortunate to receive a grant from the National Eye Institute. National Eye Institute is part of the National Institute of Health, which is the big federal agency that funds most biomedical research. 
and we are conducting a phase one two study exploring the safety and potential efficacy of this cell therapy in patients with persistent vision loss from central retinal vein occlusion. Uh, we are also uh, getting more animal data and clinical data in patients with retinitis pigmentosa, and we are in the process of looking for uh, grant funding to explore uh, this cell therapy in retinitis pigmentosa, a phase one, two study. So that's where we are right now. Great. Thanks, Dr. Park. And I want to come back to you uh, in, about a particular phrase you used, that you got FDA clearance. That's a really important aspect of your study that a lot of stem cell studies don't have. And we'll come back to that. But Dr. Rodman, do you want to tell us a bit about your role at uh, ProQR? Well, I'm glad to. Can everybody hear me okay? No. Oh, that was a rhetorical question, huh? Um, you're, you're coming in a little, a little faintly. Maybe if you can move closer to your mic. Okay, here we go. Better? I think that's better. Okay, folks, I hope you can hear me. So I'm Dave Rodman. I'm a physician by training, and at ProQR, where I lead R&D in eye disease, I, I always found it ironic because I'm trained as a lung doctor and a critical care physician. And so finally, with COVID-19 complicating everything, I feel like uh, my training is coming back into vogue. And so I noticed, for instance, there are a lot of questions that people have about how it's going to affect trials and so on. And feel free to ask those questions and maybe I can answer them in a little while. So at ProCure, we've got um, a platform technology which is really just a little bit different from gene therapy and gene correction, even cell-based therapy. And that's we produce these little oligonucleotides that are similar to the ones your body makes. Um, and they, because of that, the cells in your retina will take them up, thinking that it's a signal they're supposed to look at. And so we can inject our drug into the posterior part of the eye, but we don't need to do surgery. It's a simple outpatient procedure. And every cell in the retina takes it up. And what that means is that in contrast to a gene therapy, which can be terrific for changing the biology in a small part of the retina, our drugs can affect the entire retina, and that's really good in early disease. So our theory is that our drugs can go into patients, uh, babies and patients as soon as they become symptomatic, and ideally prevent progression and the need for gene therapy later in life. That's great. Th thanks, Dr. Rodman. So, Let's uh, go back to Dan, and I, I have a two-part question, and you can take your time with this one. Um, a lot of people are always interested in participating in clinical trials, and it's not a trivial thing. And can you talk about what people should expect when they enroll in a clinical trial? And then part two is obviously COVID-19, obviously and unfortunately, COVID-19 is having an impact on clinical research. And if you could talk about that secondarily. Yes, yeah, so why don't I take your first, your second question first. Uh, that's a shorter uh, answer. Right now for our group, uh, we have temporarily suspended all uh, patients uh, visiting the hospital trial centers uh, in light of all the recent circumstances with COVID-19, patient safety is obviously paramount. So at this point uh, for our group, we have not uh, uh, continued those clinical trials in person. Now, some of the uh, clinical trials that we're doing long-term follow-up studies and things of that nature that can be done by phone, uh, those are continuing. However, any in-person uh, visits uh, for the trial are currently suspended. When it comes to our treatment centers, and I, I will just mention that those are really the hospital's decisions, but uh, for the most part, only the most uh, um, medically necessary visits are being conducted at those centers, and, and those are really at the discretion, obviously, of those hospitals. So when it comes to clinical trials, this, uh, for especially for gene therapy, and we're talking about uh, gene therapy trials that uh, are 
specific for a certain uh, gene. So uh, many of the things that Ben talked about were concerning uh, what we call specific gene therapy trials, whether it's X-linked RP for RPGR or some of the achromatopsias. So first and foremost is really that you have to qualify. So there is a certain amount of criteria that you have to fulfill. One of the most important is obviously genetic testing. And even if you're not uh, thinking about being a part of a um, clinical trial, if you have an inherited retinal disease, obviously the definitive diagnosis is to get your uh, genetic test done so they can confirm which gene is having that variant or mutation. So with that said, clinical trials are a little different in that we really are looking for a subset of the population. And so there are certain criteria that you would have to be a part of, uh, certain aspects of maybe your vision and acuity or uh, visual fields, or in our case, because we were using a mobility test, uh, you had to have a certain level of performance on that test so we could measure any kind of uh, change uh, in visual behavior after uh, intervention. With that said, clinical trials take a lot of time. Uh, they are usually inpatient visits. Uh, obviously, for our case, uh, it meant that you would have surgery in one eye for uh, delivering of the uh, gene in our phase one studies and then in both eyes in our phase three studies. And so that obviously involves hospital time, it involves traveling to certain centers for us. We had two centers in the United States and all the surgeries were done at those two centers, as well as all the follow-up visits were also done at those two centers. And for some of our patients, that meant crossing the ocean. Uh, and these visits can be relatively frequent in the beginning. And so there is quite a bit of time involved. And as well as when you're actually at the center, there are a number of tests that we would uh, want to do. Obviously, we try and keep in mind uh, that uh, you only have so much energy and, and so much time to, to do these. And we, so we space it out. And because our clinical trials involve children, uh, we also had to keep that in mind and we space things out a, a little more. Uh, you'll find uh, clinicaltrials.gov is a great resource that it lists clinical trials uh, around the world. But I will put a caveat on that is that it doesn't mean that it's necessarily gone through any kind of vetting process. And so you have to be careful about clinical trials uh, because some of them, uh, well, I'll just say what for us, uh, there was no cost to the patient, obviously, no cost for the drug. They received the, the quality care throughout the whole process. Uh, we paid for all the travel and, and expenses and things of that nature. And that's the way clinical trials should be run. It really should not be any cost uh, to the patient because the patient is already putting out a lot of time and effort and really saying that I don't know exactly what's gonna happen, uh, but I'm willing to uh, be a part of your trial. And obviously there's an extensive informed consent process uh, that is very important where the primary investigator will talk to you about uh, all the potential benefits that might be, but really what the risks are. Uh, and, and because our, our procedure actually requires a, a surgical procedure, a vitrectomy and a subretinal injection, it's not only the risk that there might be with the actual uh, virus and the trans gene that we are now using to do gene therapy, but also with the uh, surgery itself. And that's just uh, whether it's part of gene therapy or not, they would go through that uh, so they want to really talk you through the whole process and, and you really should be in a place where you are comfortable, your questions have all been answered, uh, to make that kind of a, a decision to move forward in a clinical trial. So those are the, the basics of most clinical trials. Uh, phase one cl clinical trials are usually more about safety and they may even do different doses to try and figure out which dose is the best and most effective while still being safe. And uh, that's really paramount in all the trials, whether it's a phase one, two, or three, the safety profile is definitely one of the main things that they're looking at. And as clinical trials go, the early phases are really more about safety. So a lot of times, you'll, especially in these rare diseases, you'll see a phase one, two, where they combine things of that nature. But it's really phase three where they will say there is a primary outcome measure. So one test that really wants to drive home the uh, therapeutic uh, 
uh, benefit of the uh, inter intervention. Um, although they look at the totality of the data, so they'll look at everything and there'll be primary, a primary endpoint and there'll be several secondaries and possibly some exploratory and tertiary endpoints as well. Uh, but in phase three is where they really look to see if the patient has benefit and really it is all about changing the quality of life for that patient. Is it clinically meaningful uh, at the end? So uh, that's, that's the main thing on a clinical trial. That's great. Thanks, Dan. So, uh, Dr. Park, there are a lot of alleged stem cell clinical trials or stem cell therapies, as Dan was alluding to, that people can pay for in clinics. Some are in Florida. For, for some reason, they're in the South. And they tend to be um, overseas as well. And often, they're taking adipose tissue, fat tissue, or sometimes bone marrow. But those trials are not, those aren't really trials because as Dan said, people are paying for them. And even more um, important is that the FDA is not monitoring those trials for safety. And can you talk more about the FDA's role in in authorizing a clinical trial and what they require from you to ensure that what you're doing is as safe as possible? So thank you. Um, this is a very important point. Uh, as I mentioned, we have been in conversation with the FDA. In fact, we talked to the FDA three years before we even initiated the clinical trial. Uh, to find out what they exactly needed to show that the cell therapy is safe enough to explore in patients. And they gave me a list of studies I had to do in animals first. And it took us three years to finish that study before we got approval from the FDA to test the cell therapy in patients. Now, we did publish the preliminary findings of the first six patients we treated. And unfortunately, people have taken that data as justification to uh, treat patients uh, often very desperate to get some visual gain, um, charge money, and inject uh, cellular material from bone or fat tissue that have, that have not been characterized. And the, these things are being done without any regulation from the FDA or um, IRB. Uh, they're often charging a lot of money to the patients. And often they're treating both eyes, which is really kind of dangerous. We never do that in, in um, regulated clinical trials because you worry about possible bad things happening from treatments that have not been fully characterized and still investigational. So, um, so currently, um, I don't have a map to show you, but there are, quote, stem cell centers popping up all over the US and international. And many of these centers are also saying they're treating patients with vision loss from macular degeneration or other conditions that we cannot treat currently. And they're charging uh, thousands of dollars treating both eyes, and the New England Journal of um, Medicine Journal um, recently published case reports of patients who lost what remaining vision they had in both eyes uh, from trying these treatments. And so it's very important to know that currently, except for the um, uh, gene therapy for RP65, there is no gene therapy or stem cell therapy that's been FDA approved. Uh, all the other treatments we're discussing today are all investigational, meaning we're still trying to figure out whether the treatment is safe and beneficial to the patients. And so just to the um, attendees, just be very careful of any, quote, clinical trials, even if they're registered in clinicaltrials.gov, if they're treating both eyes or um, if they're charging a lot of money. And if you have any questions, you should uh, check and see if they have clearance from the Food and Drug Administration because they're very particular about trials that they clear to, um, uh, for investigation. They have very high standards and they wanna make sure that uh, 
we have maximum data on safety and efficacy before um, patients are subjected to these investigational treatments. That's great. Thank you. Yes. The two takeaways, don't pay. And just because it's on clinicaltrials.gov doesn't mean it's a legitimate trial. So very good. And, and Dr. Rodman, can you talk more about how your antisense oligonucleotides work? I know I gave kind of a layman's or poor man's discussion of how the um, antisense oligonucleotide works and maybe um, starting off with what RNA are might help with that discussion as well. Okay, Ben, let me give a try at that. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I, I don't wanna get too technical, but when, I, when we look at the first three programs we have that are all in the clinic right now, the first program was for a disease called uh, Leber's congenital amaurosis type 10. And the type of mutation, uh, so that's inherited as, a, as an autosomal recessive. So both parents give a defective copy of the gene. And the mutation we're after, which is the most common mutation in LCA, is what's called intronic. And what it does is it makes the cell have a mistake when it goes to take the gene and turn it into the template called RNA, which is in between making the gene and making the functional protein. It's, it puts a typographical error in there that leads to the protein not being made. Um, the second disease we're studying is called Usher syndrome type 2A. Again, a relatively common mutation in that disease we're targeting. But what we target there are a, is a hot spot in the gene in a coded region, something called exon 13, where dozens of mutations can occur. Again, you need to inherit one copy from each parent, but it doesn't have to be the same mutation. It just has to be in that place to get in our trial. Um, patients can have mutations in other parts of the gene but as long as they have one copy in exon 13, we can go after it. So there, the RNA, we, we, instead of in the first case where we essentially put a patch over the, the mistake so that the cell makes a normal protein, in the second disease, we actually chop out a tiny little piece of the protein itself at the RNA level, and the protein that's made still works, even though it's missing that little piece. And finally, the last disease, which is dominant negative retinitis pigmentosa, here you only need to inherit one bad gene from either parent, and it will overwhelm the normal gene in the other copy. And so here what we do is we simply try to suppress or knock down that bad gene and let the good gene come out and work. So we're looking at three different mechanisms, but only one basic technology, which is in a computer program, identifying and then designing drugs that can um, affect what we want to do, either mask a typographical error, cut out a, an area of mutation, or suppress completely a defective gene, and then um, move on then to see if it's therapeutically efficacious. So. It's a very flexible platform. It's highly computationally based. So we, as opposed to screening hundreds, thousands, or even millions of molecules, we screen about 30. And we rapidly get down to a panel of three or four. And those are the ones we put into the retina from patients that we've grown in the lab. Take the best one of those and then take it into the trial. Great. Thank you for that explanation. I'm going to ask for, I have one follow-up question. And the ProQR approach involves an injection into the vitreous of the eye, the middle of the eye, which is different, at least today, than where a lot of other treatments get injected, which is subretinally. Can you talk about the benefits of intravitreal injections? Well, sure I can, Ben, and, and let me just say that I'm 
I'm a um, I, I'm I'm a gene therapy guy, and um, I worked in gene therapy, and I think gene therapy is a really powerful tool. And the I want to talk about the benefits of gene therapy just for a minute before I answer your question directly. Sure. So when you look at a disease where there might be a hundred mutations that cause the gene, and ultimately the defect is you don't make enough of that protein, gene therapy is really the most rational approach to fix that because you don't have to be specific to the mutation. You, need, you just need to put in a, a new copy. The challenge is that the toolkit we have today for gene therapy is still pretty rudimentary. And remember, we've been working on this since the 1990s. Um, I'm a ref I used to do therapy for cystic fibrosis and I've done human trials for CF with gene therapy. The body doesn't particularly like viral vectors. The viral vectors themselves can't be used twice usually because the immune system will uh, recognize them the second time. They have, right now the delivery is somewhat limited in terms of how much of the retina you can treat. It takes surgery and the size of the genes we can put in are relatively limited. All of that will go away with gene therapy. We will end up with vectors you can put in the vitreous that get to all the cells in the retina. We will end up with vectors that can handle a bigger expression cassette. And we will end up in a situation where modest immunosuppression allows us to redose the drugs. It's just we're not there today. And so when we looked at the technology that was available with antisense and other oligonucleotides, what we realized was the eye is a very specialized compartment where oligonucleotide therapies are ideal. And so what we find is that if we inject our drugs into the vitreous of the eye, not only don't they get blocked by this limiting membrane and get to every cell, but we make them very stable. So we only have to dose the drug once a year or once every six months, um, and we can redose. And it's pretty simple, and the complication rate's quite low for the procedure. And so those are the advantages. In this day and age, in 2020, it's really the only technology that's available that can get to all the cells, can have a pretty durable response, and wouldn't preclude patients in the future getting a vector-based gene therapy should that turn out to be the more appropriate treatment for them down the road. So it has a lot of advantages, and the biggest one is it's here today, and it can be used today, and it's already been used to make drugs as well. Thank you, Dr. Rodman. And yes, so far, um, your emerging therapies are performing impressively. Um, Chris, I think we're ready to open it up to um, our attendees and try to field some questions from them. Sure. So there's um, many questions. And just so everybody knows, um, we are going to try to address as many questions as we can today. If not, we will reach out directly to you to address those questions. Um, questions can be asked through the chat and also the Q&A box. And you can also send questions to info at fightingblindness.org. Um, ben, there's lots of questions coming in about clinical trials. Can you remind people, because they are getting very specific to certain diseases, um, can you remind everyone what's the best approach someone can take to learn more about the clinical trial status for a particular diagnosis? Sure. Really, the, the simplest thing is to go to clinicaltrials.gov, and you can search on diseases, the information can be a little overwhelming because there's a lot of information, but it will tell you what sites the trials are at. Um, you can also go to fightingblindness.org, our site. Uh, we do report on many of the clinical trials and we do have our handy dandy um, clinical trial chart. You know, maybe that's something we can um, send out to people. Um, and you can contact us as well. I mean, it, it does take a little effort to figure out what trials are right for people, depending on what their uh, genetic profile is, where their vision is at, if they have a lot of vision left, if um, 
their, if they have more advanced disease. But I, I think starting at clinicaltrials.gov and fightingblindness.org are good places. And depending on your eye doctor, some eye doctors are really good in this space and they know the trials. Others may not be quite as tuned in. You, you may want to reach out to your doctor as well. Thanks, Ben. Another uh, question that was also coming in, the benefits of my retina tracker. Um, should someone, once they're registered, should they just sit around and wait? Or is it one of those that they will be contacted if they may qualify for a clinical trial? Good question. So I would never just sit around and wait. First of all, if they have new information about their disease, if their vision changes, they find their gene, upload the information. Secondly, and this doesn't address the question directly, but just by being in my retina tracker, your data may be observed by researchers and clinicians, even if you're not notified. So let's say a company goes in today, but they're not planning on launching a clinical trial for three years. But if they're looking, and I'm just being completely hypothetical, but let's say they're looking for people with rhodopsin mutations, and you're in there and you've, you happen to have a rhodopsin mutation, and when they do their search, they get a lot of people that hit their search and they never get your personal information, but they get a, a, a lot of hits, then that tells them that they can do recruitment in a few years for a clinical trial and get the people they need. So it's important to be in now so you're on the radar screen of companies that are looking off into the future for tr clinical trial recruitment. In the meantime, as I just said, go to clinicaltrials.gov, talk to us, um, visit fightingblindness.org. And obviously, this very webinar was, I have to say, a good way to learn about clinical trials that are underway. Thanks, Ben. One more question uh, for you before we go to our panelists. Um, if someone has been genetically tested um, in the past, are do they qualify for the open access genetic testing? Or on also on the flip side, if a gene has not been identified, are they eligible? Sure. So the panel that we're using or the Blueprint Genetics uh, is using to get no cost genetic testing of that panel, you can't have been tested with a larger panel that's usually 32 genes or more since 2016. Because if you have, then you don't qualify for our panel. But if, you're, if you got results um, that you're not quite sure what to do with, uh, perhaps they're inconclusive, perhaps you don't understand them, I think a really great exercise or thing to do is to contact Inform DNA and get genetic counseling because they'll be able to look at your report and guide you in what the next best steps are. Their genetic counseling is available over the phone. They're extremely knowledgeable about our space, the IRDs. Um, if you get uh, genetically tested through our program, you get informed DNA genetic counseling at no cost. If you're going directly to them with a report you already have, there is a cost, but um, it may be covered by insurance. Regardless, I strongly suggest people talk to Inform DNA. That really helps people understand what those results mean and what they can potentially do down the road. Sometimes it makes sense to have other family members tested, um, there are a lot of potential paths and informed DNA will help people understand what the best ones are. Thanks, Ben. The, this question came in for Dr. Rodman. Um, do you have the capabilities to test in your facility for autosomal dominant RP1? And if so, how do we find out more about that and getting in contact with you? Well, I, I'd say the 
best way to uh, is to get a hold of me, and I'll answer that. I'll get, talk to my team to get a hold of them. We don't do the gen genotyping, though, so we would re recommend that you go through the FFB uh, to get genotyping done. Um, but I certainly am, am can be helpful to you if you want, and the FFB can give you contact information if you reach out to them. Yeah, I would say reach out to us on that. I I'm I have some more questions about what this person means by testing for RP1. It sounds like they may know or have a sense of what the gene might be. So I'm not I I, I want to make sure I understand exactly what they're trying to figure out. Sounds good. Thanks. The um, in, in broad, this is overall for all the panelists, and I know Dr. Chong, you spoke to this a, a little bit. The one of the questions is with the coronavirus and COVID nineteen, how is that impacting you know further clinical trials or even treatments um, that are undergoing right now? Well, I, I guess I can start with that. For for us, uh, the treatment that involves actually pre-treating patients with uh, steroids which dampens the immune response uh, because anytime you do any type of intervention in the eye, you, you tend to get uh, some type of inflammatory response. Usually it's very mild. Um, <clears throat> but because of that, uh, the hospitals have uh, postponed all those uh, treatments uh, as of now. And again, these are uh, hospitals. They make those decisions as to what they believe uh, to be uh, best for the patient. Obviously, we fully support that. And again, when it comes to our clinical trials, uh, we have informed our ocular centers, and I'm talking about uh, eyes, but I believe it's company-wide. Uh, we have postponed uh, any further uh, intervention or in-person in visits uh, to our trial centers. Great. Is there anyone, uh, Dr. Rodman or Dr. Park, would you like to uh, address that from your experience right now? Well, I'm sorry, I was responding to some of the questions. Um, I didn't hear the question that you're discussing. Sure, um, basically for each of the panelists, some of the questions that have been going, going in is, what is happening um, within the space from treatment to diagnosis to clinical trials with coronavirus and COVID-19? So, um, you know, basically for all medical centers um, with shelter in place uh, restrictions from the government, we are limiting care to patients who need urgent care. So uh, for clinical trial, including our clinical trial, as was mentioned by uh, Dr. Chang, we are limiting um, uh, patient visits unless there are safety issues. So we do contact our patients by phone, and if there are any concerns that there might be some safety issues, then we would have to have them come in to make sure that they're properly taken care of. But um, as a clin uh, practicing ophthalmologist, I only see patients that need urgent or intervention, uh, and so we are not seeing patients for routine testing and routine examination. So I believe that's the case for most clinical trials at the current time. Yeah, so I can answer for, for Procure. Um, for the most part, we're in the same position. We have multi-center trials that are global going on, and there's quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of where local regulations preclude patients from coming in for almost any reason versus sites where say the ophthalmology group is so separated say from the general hospital and the critical care facilities that in fact they can rely more on just local regulations and so out of maybe 20 sites globally we do have one site that so far it wants to continue to be active and their local IRB supports that and so we haven't 